She's hoping to be in charge of the economy after the election and to convince us that she's the right woman for the job. Rachel Reeves is pursuing a cautious approach to the public finances and she says Labour would stick to Tory spending plans. Between Labour's self-imposed fiscal rules and the measures in last week's budget, possibly the last before the election, is a ch shadow chancellor running out of room to manoeuvre. I spoke to Rachel Reeves a little earlier. Let's talk about the budget uh, that we've just seen. Um, knowing what you do now, is it still your intention to stick to the spending plans laid out by the government? Well, there are areas where we would do more. And I have already announced um, a, a small number of targeted tax increases to provide an immediate injection of cash into public services. So it's why I've said, for example, that private schools should pay VAT and business rates, and that money should go into the 93% of our children at state schools. It's why I've said that we would close the loopholes whereby some of the biggest uh, oil and gas companies are not paying um, a, a proper amount of tax based on the windfall profits they're making we would close those loopholes and we would use that money to fund investment in some of the industries of the future from carbon capture and storage to gigafactories to, for electric vehicles to floating offshore wind. So there's a number of areas where we would go further than uh, the government and provide that immediate injection of cash but, into but, public services. But, uh, but overall, uh, you plan to stick to the same fiscal rules to cap, essentially cap borrowing and so on. You, you're not planning to... I mean, I, I, we have um, fiscal rules which I will enforce with an iron discipline. They're slightly different to the government's fiscal rules in that they uh, separate out investment on day-to-day -day spending and on things that we need to build and boost our long-term productivity and growth. But, yes, we've said that we would get debt falling as a share of GDP, we would balance day-to-day -day spending with tax receipts, and then subject to that, we would invest in those things to boost our growth and productivity, because that, Trevor, is absolutely key and has been the missing ingredient in the government's economic approach the last 14 years. Uh, if our economic growth had have been at the same rate of similar countries, OECD developed economies, over the last 14 years, our economy would be £140 billion bigger. That's worth £5,000 for every family in Britain and would okay. mean we could have bought in £50 billion of additional tax receipts without raising a penny of tax. So we've got right. to get our economy growing again. And that's... All right. So, forgive me, just... Um, so, you have established that you're, you're basically working in the same envelope well, as the current... it's not exactly the, the <laughs> same envelope, Trevor, for the reasons that I've given, the yeah. uh, windfall tax, the uh, different VAT well, and well, business well, uh, rates for private schools, can, for example. Can I come to that? Can I come to that? Uh, are you feeling a bit sore that the Chancellor has shot at least two of your foxes, the windfall tax being one, the other one being the abolition of non-DOM status? You, we can talk about timetabling and so on, but essentially, he's taken that from you, hasn't he? Well, look, the non-DOMs is an utter humiliation for this government. The last budget of these of, of this parliament, they've had 14 years and they used this moment to close a non-DOM tax loophole that everyone has been aware of for years. If they had have done this when uh, we first announced it, we could have bought in billions of pounds extra to either keep taxes down for working people or indeed inject but, money but, into our public services. So frankly, reason, Trevor, what has taken them so long? Isn't, isn't that a little bit ungenerous? Isn't that a little bit ungenerous? Generous. Both you and your colleagues have been saying for, well, a couple of years now, this is what the government should do, and you urge them to do it. In fact, uh, I can play you a clip of your colleague, Wes Streeting, uh, urging uh, the government to do exactly what they've done. And he is welcome to nick Labour's plan to abolish the non-DOM tax status and train 7,500 more doctors every year. A plan so good, Mr Speaker, the Chancellor himself admitted the Conservative government should nick it. Why aren't you saying this morning, jolly good, well done, Jeremy? Because I could have done it years ago and we could have reduced those NHS hospital waiting lists, as Wes set out. More than 7 million are on hospital waiting lists. Imagine what good could have been done if the Chancellor and Prime Minister had have done this years ago. So it is a humiliation that they're doing it at this late stage. They've run out of ideas. They're quickly running out of uh, road. Let me just also say on the but windfall tax, uh, Trevor, because you asked me about that as well. There are two problems that the government had with the windfall tax. 
tax. The first was that it didn't extend to the end of the next uh, parliament. They've done that. That will raise about a billion pounds, just a little bit more. But there's also loads of loopholes in their energy profits levy, which means that many companies aren't even paying uh, any of the energy profits levy at all, or if they are, very small amounts. So we would close those loopholes and that would bring in uh, over £7 billion during the course of the next uh, parliament. So uh, we but, would use that money to invest in the jobs and the industries of the future. But, and I've made an announcement today, Trevor, that you would have seen on the front page well, I want to, of the Sunday I, I, Times I want, on that. I want, to come to, I want to come to that announcement in just a second, but just one last point on, on this issue. Uh, you, you said that you, you, know, you think that they haven't got it exactly right and so on, but broadly speaking, they have done what you said should be done. They've allocated the funds elsewhere, tax cuts. Um, where are you going to find the money now to uh, fulfil your promises? Uh, breakfast clubs, childcare and so on and so forth. Well, we said that we would have used the non-DOMS money to uh, create two million additional appointments every year in the National Health Service to reduce waiting lists. So where's that money yeah, coming well, from Well, let me now? just tell you what the, the commitments were. 700,000 uh, emergency dental appointments and free breakfast clubs at all primary uh, schools. The government, of course, on Wednesday uh, have used that money uh, elsewhere. And so I will now, with my team, go through the documents published this week in an orderly way and identify those funds streams. Those pledges very much stand. They are national priorities and they are Labour's priorities as well. And we will now make sure we identify the funding streams because everything in our manifesto will be fully costed. And, fully and you reckon funded. you can do that without, without borrowing? Uh, there will not be uh, additional borrowing for day-to-day -day spending in Labour's manifesto. I've been very clear about the fiscal rules to get debt falling as a share of GDP, to pay for day-to-day -day expenditure through tax receipts, and there won't be anything in our manifesto that breaks those rules. Uh, but I think right. it is right, and your viewers would expect me to go through the, uh, the documents uh, methodically no, no, and I... make sure we identify that funding. Let me ask you about another bit of public spending. Um, Chance has put aside three and a half billion pounds uh, for technology to improve NHS efficiency. Um, can the NHS now start to spend that money in full confidence that even if there is a change of government and you are Chancellor, it will not be clawed back? Absolutely. And Wes Streeting, okay. our Shadow Health Secretary, has uh, already spoken about the need to uh, improve productivity, to use technology better in our national uh, health service. And that's true in other public services as well, whether it is okay. schools uh, or work and pensions. Uh, let me ask you about something else that I think is very important to most viewers and most people. Um, Europe's largest local authority, Birmingham, uh, essentially has gone bust. It's, su it's surviving because governments allowing it to uh, raise council tax by over 20%. There are another six, seven, eight, possibly more local authorities uh, who say they're on the verge of bankruptcy. And we know that what Mr Hunt's plans are going to do will be uh, lead to funding cuts for uh, local councils. Now, if you come into government, you could give them the cash to dig them out. You could allow them to raise council taxes. Or you could simply say, sink or swim. What, what in principle, what are you going to say, particularly to those Labour councillors, about their future? They, they need some answers of uh, direction now. Yeah, look, I understand the huge challenges that local authorities are facing after uh, the cuts that have been experienced these last uh, 14 years. In the government's uh, current plans, um, expenditure on public services increases by 1% in real terms over the course of the next parliament. Uh, so overall, there aren't cuts uh, to public spending, but I'm under no illusions about the scale of the challenge that I will inherit if I become Chancellor well, we know uh, later those... this year. And I, I need to be honest with people. We know I'm some not departments to... are protected. Local councils are not. Yeah. So what are you going to say to the local councils? Are you going... A lot of Labour councils yeah. hope so, that Labour will win and you'll be the cavalry coming over the hill. But I need to be honest, Trevor. I'm not going to be able to fix all the problems uh, straight away. The government have caused huge damage both to our public finances and also to our public services. There is a plan to inject uh, money uh, through the targeted tax increases that I've already uh, spoken about. But in the end, we have got to grow our economy because it is only through growing our economy that we're going to have the 
the money both to improve living standards and have money for our public services. So, so and that's that, why my focus is on reforming the planning system to get Britain building again, reforming so, so, the apprenticeship levy to help businesses get the skills that they need, our national wealth fund to leverage in private sector investment to grow the economy. If we do those so things, is, we will bring in the tax revenue and we will be able to invest in public services again. There's no so that, shortcut. That, that is the way so, to so do that it. Is, so that, that is ad admirably clear. You are saying to local councils, don't imagine that when Labour turns up, it's all going to get fixed. You are going to face the toughest uh, time of your life because we're not just going to drop money on you to solve the problems that have arisen. I've been really clear, Trevor, that everything on manifesto will be fully costed and fully funded. But the Office of Budget Responsibilities forecast is based on the government's plans for growth and for our economy. Labour's plans are different plans. Uh, businesses okay. say that if we reform the planning system, we can build okay. more homes and we can boost our energy infrastructure investment with private sector okay. money. That will bring in tax revenues that will right. mean we can start investing in our public services. So things will look and feel different under a Labour government, but only right. if we could grow the economy in the way that I've set out. That is Rachel the way Reeves. to improve our public services. Rachel Rees, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you. Listening to what you could see of that interview was my next guest, the director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who is now the great oracle on all matters pertaining to public finances, Paul Johnson. Um, Paul, uh, of what you could hear um, and what you've heard from the opposition since uh, the budget, um, what do you think uh, the, their reaction to the fact that uh, the government's shot their foxes is, is, is like? I mean, have they, have they got a great big hole in their plans now, do you think? No, not really. I, I mean, I think it's a, in a way it's a slightly unhelpful description to say they've shot some foxes. I mean, what they've done actually is made more certain that this revenue is going to come in because it's already been enacted. So, but, but, but two things. First, this is a really small amount of money, a couple of billion from non-DOMs, one billion from the energy profits levy. That's not going to make much difference to anything. And so, you know, this was always just you know, a, a, a part of the politicking. You know, here we've got two or three policies which sound big, but actually not big enough to do anything. The government's um, introducing a couple of them, so the Labour Party will have that money for sure. The big challenge, really, from the budget for the for the opposition is that the Chancellor spent ten billion a year on cutting national insurance contributions, and unless the Labour in government would reverse that one way or another, that means they've got ten billion less for investment in public services. But, but the, the plans that they've both adopted, or that the government's put forward and Rachel Rees says she'll follow, um, envisage a 1% increase uh, in public spending above inflation. Uh, so explain why you think this means cuts at any point. The key point is that health spending is getting on for half of all of our public service spending. It's over 40% of all public service spending. There is no world in which health spending will only go up by 1% a year. It will go up a lot more than that, not least because the, uh, of the um, uh, commitment to the NHS workforce plan. Probably the biggest fiscal event in my lifetime, actually. Last June, uh, the government announced an NHS workforce plan, which by itself will cost as much as the entire defence budget over the next de decade or well, so. I mean, that, that's 50, the scare, 50, 50 billion, billion a year just, or just, 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 just enormous. Well, the Chancellor did spare the NHS from some of the more eye-wateringly tight settlement for departmental spending in his budget, budget last week, as Paul's just been saying. But economists point out that the £2.5 billion Jeremy Hunt announced for the health service next year will merely prevent a real terms fall in funding. And polls suggest voters care at least as much about the public services, including the health service, as getting a tax cut. So a little earlier, I spoke to Health Secretary Victoria Atkins. How is it that a party which is going to raise the tax burden to over 37%, the highest it's been since the Second World War, um, has the gall to tell us that it's a tax-cutting party? Because that's exactly what we've done, not just in this budget, 
but also no, in isn't. the previous... Put taxes up. Trevor, let Seven me... Seven million people will be dragged into a higher tax Trevor, ban by 2029. Let me just... Let, just give me a moment just to unpack this. So, in this uh, budget and in the autumn statement, we have provided cuts to national insurance for some 29 million workers. What that means is that someone on the average salary of, let's say, £35,400 will see a tax cut of up to £900 in their pay packets. That matters because that will make a real difference to the nurses, the hospital porters, the receptionists and other people who work in the NHS. But it is also important because it shows that we, we know that the last couple of years have been tough. They've been very tough because we spent £400 billion uh, looking after us all in the pandemic and uh, with the cost of living pressures arising out of the war in Ukraine. But we as Conservatives believe that we have to deal with that debt ourselves. We do not want to pass that debt on to our children and our grandchildren, which is why we had to make forgive some very difficult decisions. But, but we've done this whilst also protecting day-to-day -day spending get, in the I, NHS. Forgive me, I get all of that, but your person on 35,000, they'll get an inflation uh, increase and they might get a little promotion and suddenly they're into a 40% tax ban. So you've given them a bit on, on national insurance, but actually, by freezing the threshold, you're actually taking more well, from them. So and in fact, what we know is you're getting an extra seven billion or so, but actually you're taking, because of the threshold freezing, something north of 20 billion a year. Now, why not be level with us? Well, in For fairness... The reasons you've just given, <laughs> probably the government needs more tax revenue. Why not just be straight and say, we're taking more money from you. So, Trevor, in fairness, I was Financial Secretary to the Treasury when we had to make that very difficult decision about uh, thresholds, and I was completely straight uh, every single interview I did about that. And we do not resolve from that. What we're saying is that uh, our conviction that we cannot pass these debts on to our children and our grandchildren still stand, but we want to help reduce taxes in practical ways for people who are working, and we've achieved this just not just in the spring budget, as I say, but also in autumn statement. And we have done that without borrowing, without, uh, uh, you know, um, increasing, right. uh, reducing um, spending across departments. And so okay. we have here a budget that has delivered a tax cut whilst okay. also protecting, as a health secretary, day-to-day -day spending on the NHS and, importantly, oh. also dealing with the high interest, uh, high income child benefit, which I know many of your viewers have um, felt, you know, very strongly about. Yes. We're trying to reduce that so that more, fewer people are caught okay. by that and we make it fairer for those families that have single incomes. Let's just spend a minute on, on, on your own specific area of responsibility, which of course does have an impact. Um, uh, the biggest break on growth, uh, I think the Chancellor's acknowledged, is that over 9 million uh, working age adults are off work because of sickness and uh, about a third of those are off because um, of uh, some long-term uh, illness and particularly mental health. Uh, Three million or thereabouts on incapacity benefits. Uh, what are you going to do about that as Health Secretary? Surely you've got a contribution to make here in getting people back to work. Very much so. And uh, as we, we've we always said in the past, that a strong economy helps pay for the NHS. I also think, actually, a strong and productive NHS uh, supports a growing economy. And as you've set out in the figures, there is a... We have to try to encourage people back into work. Now, well, the Prime Minister... What are you going to do to make it worth their while? Because, actually, they... They, don't, they clearly don't feel they have to go back to work. Well, so as the Prime Minister has set out today in an interview in one of the Sunday papers, we want to tackle uh, the uh, increase that we've seen over the last decade or so of people being able to sign off long-term sick when they may well be living with conditions that we can help... You know, if we can help um, uh, look after those conditions with them, then they will be able to return to work. Can I just ask you one last question, which is, I, I guess, a, a straightforward one as a woman parliamentarian. The big news of the week is that Theresa May has decided that she's not coming back after the next election. <clears throat> um, she opposed all women shortlist, but she was a sponsor of the Conservative mm. Women to Win uh, campaign. Um, you've got 88 female Tory MPs now, but that's actually a quarter of your total compared to Labour's 52%, half, which came about largely because of all women shortlist. Was um, Theresa May right? 
Well, first of all, can I play tribute to Teresa? It has been an absolute privilege uh, to work with Teresa, not just when she was Prime Minister, but also the work she's continued since then, including in topics such as domestic abuse. Uh, we brought forward, of course, the Domestic Abuse Act. And Teresa, as Prime Minister, was critical in driving that forward, but also her work uh, surrounding diabetes as well. So and she's, she, she will be so, so sorely missed. In terms of uh, Women to Win, I should declare an interest they helped me into politics um, and we've always as, as a party we've always been cautious about all women shortlist because we think actually uh, we can make real progress and I've been meeting some of the female candidates we have coming forward okay. for the next election they are brilliant and I really look forward to welcoming welcoming them to the green benches in the House of Commons. Victoria Atkins thank you so much for your time this thank morning. You.